I'll do the introduction. Tonight we're going to have, uh, to our national anthem is going to be sung by Luke Rankin and Tara Hamilton. Now, Luke is the chairman of the Lawrence County Republican Party. He's also a member, he's the, uh, on the, on the city, on the county council, county council. And we'll also, he'll be followed by John McMakin, who is an American patriot, and he has taught martial arts for about 25 years, and he's currently the owner of Macon Tree Service, and he will lead us in the Republican Creed. Oh, say, can you see? Stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight O'er the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rockets with Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. One of the best ones I've ever heard. And uh, Sheriff Lewis, Sheriff Wright, McBride, and Reynolds. The Republican Creed talks about being an uncommon man. And if you're going to be a sheriff of a county, you are an uncommon man, especially in today's times. And I'd like to say thank you all four, because I know this is a difficult job, a difficult time. I used to be a deputy for a short period of time. <clears throat> I couldn't handle it. A lifetime, a career, the, the, there's four special men up here. And uh, I would, uh, yes, yes, yes. So anyway, the Republican creed goes like this. I need a, a little help. Uh, I, I, I get really stirred up when I hear a national anthem like that. And Luke, that was wow. So anyway, I do not choose to be a common man. It is my right to be uncommon. If I can seek opportunity, not security, I want to take the calculated risk to dream and build, to fail and succeed. I refuse to barter incentive for dole. I prefer the challenges of life to guaranteed security, the thrill of fulfillment to the stale calm of utopia. I will not trade freedom for benefits, nor my dignity for a handout. I will never cower before any master, save my God. It is my heritage to stand erect, proud, unafraid, to think and act for myself, to enjoy the benefits of my creation, and stand boldly and face the world. And I 
am a free American. Keep them standing up. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And we all appreciate that rendition of our national anthem, by the way. Give them one more round of applause. You did a fantastic job. I'm going to have to put y'all on, you guys on standby for the next state convention or Silver <laughs> Elephant, I'm telling you. Uh, fantastic. Truly fantastic. And again, here in the Republican Creed again and reminding us of why we're here. And that's what we come down to. And also want to take a moment and uh, introduce and hear from a special guest that we have uh, with us here who I know is not a stranger to the folks in this room, but we're so glad to have her here this evening, uh, who does uh, her best working alongside our governor to make sure that our state continues to move forward in a positive, productive, conservative direction. Lieutenant Governor Pamela Yvette, y'all give a round of applause. Well, thank you. I'm just going to be brief because I know we want to hear from our wonderful sheriffs back here. But um, how many of you are inspired by what happened in Virginia a few weeks ago, right? <laughs> Isn't it wonderful when everybody gets together and they're passionate about the same idea? And what, is we're all, what are we all passionate about? Give, yeah, freedom. And giving the freedom to parents to make choices for their own children. To make sure that they can choose where their children are going to go to school, what their children are going to learn. And never letting anybody stand in front of them and say they don't have the right to do that. The right to to raise their children. That's something that we will continue to fight for, the governor and I, uh, every single day, making sure that the last word about our children stands with our parents. And you know, what else keeps us free? Keeps us free are our great law enforcement. You know, as we see what's unraveling around the country, and we've seen it for so long, people turning away, or they, the media would have us think that people are turning away from law enforcement, and we don't want law enforcement, but the people that they say want you the least are the people that want you the most. And here in South Carolina, you will never hear that we don't stand with our law enforcement or our amazing military. I'm proud to be here tonight and hear what our wonderful sheriffs have to say. I would love for you to give a real roaring applause for not just our four sheriffs, but the law enforcement that travel with me every day and anybody else that are in this room that's law enforcement. We couldn't do what we do. We couldn't be the state we are without them. So I Thank you all, them all for their service. And make sure when you see them out, when you see them out for breakfast or lunch, buy their breakfast and lunch. When you see them getting coffee, buy their coffee. They didn't pay me to say that, by the way. I'm just saying that. And make sure that we, we teach our children that they're here for us. They're here to protect us. And they're who we need to look up to and respect. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. Continue to work hard. We have a lot going on in 22, so we need you. The governor and I will be running down the ticket along with a lot of other great Republicans. And so we'll need your help. It is such an honor for me to be your lieutenant governor. I look forward to being your lieutenant governor for another four years. Thank you all so much for what you do for the Republican Party. Thank you, ma'am. I am guessing, though, that this is not a defund the police crowd, correct? <laughs> right? Just making sure. I thought so. Well, let's get things rolling. Let's want to introduce our panel. We have here uh, someone who I know is no stranger to y'all. Definitely not a stranger to me because, you know, he couldn't get enough of me in Charleston, and now he comes up here and he still has me on the radio. Charlie James from WORD. And also uh, from Fox Carolina, we have Cody Alcorn. And Matt Koufax. And with that, gentlemen, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Drew McKissick. We appreciate that. And just to let you know, Lieutenant Governor Pamela Evan and I were supposed to sing the national anthem tonight. <laughs> but 
said, no, we've got somebody better. Maybe next time. It's politics. It's all politics, isn't it? It's a pleasure to be here this evening. And now is the time where I get to, uh, to actually play like baseball announcer. I'm going to announce the sheriffs that we have up on stage tonight. They'll stand up and briefly give us a little history of themselves. Briefly, gentlemen. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I feel like I want to say, and now from Lawrence County, batting right-handed, <laughs> Sheriff Don Reynolds. Lord's been told, Al. I'm Don Reynolds. I'm the Lawrence County Sheriff, and I'd like to thank the people of Lawrence County for choosing me to serve. I'd also like to thank the Republican Party and the 4th District also. I spent 30 years with the Highway Patrol, proudly, and I had no idea when I became sheriff in 2016 what the world was really about. <laughs> I saw how you dressed and what you drove, but I didn't know what you act like when you went home. <laughs> <clears throat> so it was an eye-opener to me, and I was fortunate enough to be reelected in 2020. My dad was a chief of police in a small town I grew up in. He was my hero. But I've had a lot of heroes with badges since then. And I see how they have to respond to all this junk. And they have problems too, but they have to put their problems down in their pockets and go deal with everybody else like a machine. And then when they make a, a step that somebody figures is wrong, then they crucify them and they don't have any facts, much less few. But I want these people to understand, these guys here on stage, I'm here to work with them any way I can. But the people in Lawrence County, the Lawrence County Sheriff's Office is going to be there to protect your rights. It doesn't matter if it's a common criminal or the overreach of the government. That's right. Because I was born in the greatest nation in the world. That's right. On one nation under God, the USA. But if we don't stop this quacker up yonder, <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm going to end up. I shouldn't have said that. I'm going to end up in the USSR to the USA. Thanks. <laughs> well done, guys. And now from Anderson County, Sheriff Chad McBride. Good evening. I'll just say ditto. <laughs> so, uh, I started my career about 20 years ago in Anderson County as a deputy sheriff. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, the most important part of me is my people that I get to work with every single day. Uh, they put their lives on the line for our citizens of Anderson County and uh, they do a terrific job. I'm so proud of them. I'm so proud that I get to work beside them each and every day. And I'm very proud of my family. I have a beautiful wife and three beautiful daughters. And uh, I get a lot of prayers for me because I live in a house full of women. <laughs> so uh, there's so, drama at work, drama at home. So. <laughs> but uh, a little bit about myself. I just, I just turned 43. I, after college, I joined the Army, served eight years in the Army Reserves and National Guard, and like I said, most of my law enforcement career was parallel to the first uh, season of my life when I was in the uh, National Guard, and my wife said, you're going to have to pick one or the other, <laughs> one or the other, so uh, I chose to stay in law enforcement, and I miss my Army days and my friends over there, but uh, it's, it's just an honor to serve, and and proud that I can be up here with these great guys, and, uh, and I lean on these guys because, uh, you know, I admit, uh, my youth can sometimes uh, be an issue, but I, I have a great command staff at home, and I lean on them for support and experience. And of course, these guys too, are, they're, they're real accessible, and y'all have no idea how often, uh, usually it's me calling them, but, uh, but they do. They call and check on me all the time. I feel good, because every now and then we'll have a, a situation, and it's good to know that uh, these, these guys up here care about us. So it's a privilege to be here tonight, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. From Spartanburg County, Sheriff Chuck Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to talk about me too much. Um, I just know that Christ Jesus is still sitting on his throne, and we're going to make it past the Biden era. Yeah. <laughs> so, it is an honor. It's a very big honor to work along beside men that lead their teams through Christ and prayer and you know I get to go to work every day like these guys do with the best and I'm just so honored to be a part of them um, we, we're not going to quit 
Um, I, this is not a dig at the Clemson fans in here, but we are dug in like an Alabama tick. <laughs> We are not going to back up. We are not going to move. Um, we are going to carry out justice for all. Uh, all of our veterans, thank you. I'm very grateful for you. I can never repay you enough. Thank you. And now I'm from Greenville County, Sheriff Hobart Lewis. I may have a little home field advantage here, so uh, I'm, that's why they held me to the end, I think. But uh, I'm your Greenville County Sheriff, Hobart Lewis, and uh, today is my anniversary. I've been serving as your sheriff for one year and eight months, and um, it's, it's been an eventful one year and eight months. But uh, I do want to thank you for allowing me to... to, to serve and it's quite an honor and very humbling for sure. We are in critical times in this great country uh, but what I can tell you and I hope you learn tonight from having this forum and uh, getting to interact with people that you have sheriffs in South Carolina I tell people this all the time, we're different this is not other parts of the country. Uh, you got 46 sheriffs in South Carolina. You got the South Carolina Sheriff Association. We do talk a lot. Uh, we do sit down and roundtable things and, and try to forecast what might happen. So you have a good base here in South Carolina uh, for all of South Carolina. So we're very fortunate for the support we have. I'm very blessed to have the support I have here in Greenville County. Um, I would like to give some of my time to recognize some folks, and that's Master Deputy Jim Perry. If you'll raise your hand back there. Um, he's looking around. Jim has one of the most difficult jobs uh, anybody in law enforcement could have, dealing with crimes against children. He does a tremendous job. I know if Don knew we were doing this, he would have done it. But uh, Chief Deputy Chris Martin from Lawrence County sitting in the back. You got you got some other folks here uh, that also serve with SLED and DNR and some of those things. We won't call them out uh, that are protecting the uh, lieutenant governor. Uh, but these men and women, they give you everything they got, and, uh, and we appreciate you. Y'all give us an opportunity to serve and sit up here. Chuck mentioned the veterans. Thank you so much, all those that served. I'm proud to be a veteran, uh, but I have a, I have a special veteran here tonight who's also a very special friend to me. Colonel Stahl, would you stand up, please? Um, Colonel, Colonel Stahl is a, I promise you, if you read his story, he's a true American hero, but one of the most humble people I've ever met in my life. And he doesn't, he's retired from the Marine Corps, but he continues to serve veterans every day out of Congressman Timmons' office. You see him all the time with a laptop open trying to find benefits and, and get these veterans what they deserve. Uh, we know that that goofball is trying to give uh, people across the border $450,000 or whatever, uh, but Colonel Stahl is people like you who support our veterans, who get them what little bit we give them, which isn't near enough. That's where that $450,000 should go. Right. But thank you for what you do, dude. We appreciate you very Thank you to our sheriffs for participating this evening. Gentlemen, sheriffs, um, keeping the same order, could you take a minute to explain how your departments are funded and are there any areas where additional funding is necessary? We'll start with Sheriff Reynolds. We're funded through the... We're funded through the general fund, the Lawrence County General Fund, and uh, I'm not going to look in the audience to any of my county councilmen, but we certainly need more personnel, and yeah. I always need a raise because <laughs> these guys are never paid what they what they deserve. Sheriff McBride, we uh, I have a really good working relationship with my county council, so we've we've actually made a lot of strides since I've been in office. When I came in, starting pay for a deputy was $31,000 starting pay today. Five years later, it's $45,000. So uh, we've, we've made a lot of headway. Of course, I couldn't do that by myself. And uh, so our, our council has been very generous. So I, I hear horror stories all the time from a lot of sheriffs across the state. And I'm blessed that we, uh, you know, we, we can always use stuff, equipment, uh, more personnel, et cetera. But uh, it's good to have a, a good working county council behind your back. Yeah. Sheriff Wright? Uh, yes, I'm funded the same way. Um, we have a good working relationship with our county council as well. Uh, I really hope they're listening when they hear everybody applauding that we need more deputies and we need more money. You know, um, 
you know, when people move to your counties, they ask a couple of things. How's the tax basis? What's the schools looks like? And what's the police doing? So I think we're a priority, just saying. But yeah, well, we, we, we're blessed in Spartanburg, but we are going to keep fighting to do more. Sheriff Lewis. We too are supported by the general fund in Greenville County. Our budget's uh, about $61 million a year. Uh, we do have some seizure money we use for different things, whether it's interdiction and, and uh, drug issues that we face in the county. Uh, like everybody, everybody is on a mad tear to hire people and find qualified people. Uh, we've all been fortunate to, to have great people that work for us, um, but we're always looking for more. Uh, we live in a time where people do want to give up this profession and move on to something different. Uh, as far as county council, our council, they may not always agree on real estate issues and zoning and some of that stuff, but in the times we live in today, uh, we're very fortunate here in Greenville County that your county council supports public safety. Uh, they fund it. They see the need. There is a lot going on, uh, but they are very supportive for us, and we're very appreciative for that. Thank you. And just for timing reasons, uh, for some of these questions, we're going to pick a certain sheriff just to uh, talk about this. The next one, it's about uh, county prisons, uh, detention centers. And I'm going to uh, call on Sheriff McBride just because we recently featured uh, his detention center on our 10 o'clock news. And he took us inside, and if you watched that report, uh, it was pretty alarming to see how overcrowded they are. And it also comes kind of timing here because we just saw what happened down in Pulaski County in Georgia. We have uh, two accused murderers and three other inmates who escaped uh, out of a county jail over the weekend, and they're still out there. So I think it kind of shows uh, how important these detention centers are, and if you've ever stepped in one, uh, a lot of them need a lot of work, and it takes a lot of funding to get there. So uh, Sheriff McBride, can you kind of talk about where you guys are as far as your detention center? Yes, yeah, so uh, we... Uh I have the, the fun opportunity to manage the oldest jail in South Carolina that's still in operation. It was built in 1955. And, uh, you know, the problem with that is that building's used, you know, 24-7, 365, so maintenance on that building is, in, is in incredible, uh, just trying to keep it going. Yeah, there's always stuff breaking down, hinges coming off the walls. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a mess. And so uh, it's built for about 205 people. I have currently about 485, 490 in there right now. Um, the, you, the Fox did a story on it. Uh, they showed kind of the, the dilemma, you know, the jail's facing. And uh, I can tell you the worst part that they didn't get to show because they have to, you know, they'll, they'll come in and do an interview for 30 minutes, but they, for, for brevity purposes, they have to keep it at, you know, two minutes. So uh, what you don't see is or think about is the working conditions for my officers. And so this is incredibly dangerous. You have. You know, 10 inmates in a, in a cell made for four people and tensions are high there's fights all the time of course our guys have to go in and they have to fight people to stop the fight it's incredibly dangerous they do an amazing job uh, I will say we probably have the cleanest jail I think in South Carolina so uh, I think we Clorox <laughs> about 45 times a day um, so it's extremely clean if you come in there it'll smell like Clorox and some other stuff we won't go there but anyway um, so we're, we're just in, in dire need for a new facility and uh, also when you when you can cannot house more inmates it gives our local judicial system more reason to try to get people out of jail because they're worried about the overcrowding a lot of the public forgets this because I get fussed at all the time why would you let so and so out of jail well, we're responsible for putting them in jail of course I have to you know, do my best to keep them alive and fed in jail, but you know, them being let out of jail, that's not on us. That's that's on your judicial system, your your judges and uh, so forth and so on. So uh, we need in Anderson County a facility that can certainly house more criminals so we can keep people behind bars that need to be behind bars like they should be. Sheriff's Attorney General Alan Wilson, yes, thank you. Attorney General Alan Wilson has made human trafficking and sex trafficking a priority. Of the four counties represented here tonight, which county do you believe has the worst sex trafficking problem, and what are you doing to, to combat that? Um, I don't think it's fair to classify anything as worse, because if you have one in the county, that's incredibly bad. Um, I, I would say up and down the corridor of 85, all the sheriffs up and down the corridor of 85 had about the same issue. And obviously where there are more people, 
you will have more opportunities for that. So everybody, please be vigilant um, about those kind of things. You know, a lot of people nowadays, we run into, why won't you help us? Why won't you help us? Well, why don't you report it? You know, I, I need you to help me help you. So I would say Spartanburg, Greenville, and, and certainly Anderson have the most population, so that's where it would be more prevalent. And this one, I think all of you can probably respond uh, because I think it's a huge issue here in the upstate talking about drug use. Um, probably the neatest experience I ever did was uh, Sheriff Wright let me go along with Operation Rolling Thunder. Uh, I did that for three years straight. I was out there six at night until six in the morning right through law enforcement. And what you don't see is how much drugs are on 85 and how much cash. It is insane. Uh, it's probably the most eye-opening thing I've ever been a part of since I've been here. But I mean, every night on the scanner we hear OD, OD, OD. I mean, deputies are running left and right with Narcan. I mean, it's insane the overdoses we have here. But can you kind of explain the drug problem we have? Because we do have a drug problem uh, in the upstate. And I'll start with Sheriff Reynolds, and we'll just kind of come down if you guys want to start. The meth and the fentanyl is what we have an issue with naturally. The meth and the fentanyl is what we have an issue with naturally. Uh, it's, and unfortunately, going back to you referred to him as a whatever, Brandon, or whoever he is. <laughs> and they, the borders, if they close the borders, you're not going to, it's not going to help us. It's going to keep us behind the eight ball because we see an influx of fentanyl. We, uh, we get fortunate. We, uh, we get tips, complaints, and we follow them up, and we make arrests. But those blood suckers are so spread out, and, and it's just so prevalent that they, they, it is what it is. Fentanyl coming out of China, and... We just need to cut China off. So, just to keep it brief, uh, I will say this, that, that the uh, Mexican cartels, of course, are flooding the market with methamphetamines. That's probably attributes to 80, 85 percent of this nation's drug problem. And uh, what used to cost $20 uh, for a certain amount of meth, you can get for four or five bucks on the street now. So it's, it's super cheap. That's why you don't hear about meth labs anymore. You used to hear about meth labs. People used to steal all the ingredients they needed to make meth. And now it's so cheap on the street, there's no point in uh, going to your drugstore and trying to steal all the, all the stuff. Plus, they've made it harder to get Sudafed and everything else behind the counter. But the problem also is that at least that we're experiencing, I would, I would assume that y'all share my concern, is again, it kind of falls on the judicial system. Uh, we bust these drug dealers time after time after time. Uh, I can think of a, a drug house specifically that we, we've worked on in the Belton community. Uh, we've, in the last three years, we've served three search warrants there, put the people in jail uh, that is trafficking the dope, and, and unfortunately they get back out, they do it again. And they've been arrested so many times, but yet they've, they still haven't gone to trial for the first time. And so it's just a, you know, a constant cycle that we have to deal with. And that's extremely frustrating because if we could even get a few of them out of here for, for 10 years, that would help us tremendously. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, when you get the, the knucklehead letting everybody in the, across the border, our fentanyl use and, and dope use went up incredibly. I mean, I don't have a number, but it's way up there. Um, yeah, we got to quit making deals with these people. Well, here's the deal. If you get caught selling drugs, you ought to go to jail. Right. You ought to stay there more than a week a day. We, we, we do run into the, um, the other side of the uh, coin there in our judicial system. I'm trying very hard not to call nobody out, but there's a lot of deals being made. Um, you know, it's, it's time to cut the Monty Hall, let's make a deal thing out, and let's start holding people accountable. Um, we just got to hold people accountable. <laughs> yeah, who's Monty Hall? Never mind. Told you, yeah, we told you, John. Oh, Lord have mercy on me. Do you see why I have gray hair now? So, I mean, we, we have got to do a better job in our judicial system, our solicitor's office, our judges. Um, he's talking about, he's got, I mean, 400 and something in your jail? They have 890 something in hours. 
Um, I'm fortunate I don't need a new jail. We're going to put another wing on because of the, the temporary place that we had them housed by the courthouse 30 years ago, the temporary site there 30 years ago. We're just now getting it up to par. The, the thing about our detention center is I tell our deputies, we have to treat these people like they're children of God because they are. But now we, it's it's not Burger King. We don't let this. You know, you don't get it your way here. Uh, but we have the cleanest jail, and uh, I mean, we we our staff at the detention center is a very different breed. You know, they go into there and they don't have anywhere to go. They're in that little city and they do a tremendous, tremendous job of keeping the peace, keeping them medicated. Um, it's, it's, it's an awesome job that they do, but we need more deputies. So I'm recruiting. Anybody wants to go to work at the detention facility, I can talk to you right now or after work. But our drug problem drives our petty larcenies, our, our, our assault and batteries, our murders. We have those because of drugs. Um, please um, pray for us and the deputies, but get on to these people that's making deals with them. Uh, you know, the, the deal I want to make with them is if I catch you, I'll put you in jail and you get to stay there for a little while. So let's, let's, we got to work together on this one. So in Greenville County, on a weekly basis, we work about three to five overdoses per day. Um, out of that, you have seven to ten deaths a week associated with that. Uh, we issue Narcan. We have a lot of support from the community for that. People who do have children or spouses that um, are drug users know how to administer Narcan. We issue it to them. Uh, so a lot of lives are being saved. However, uh, we have a huge drug problem in Greenville County. Uh, we all are certainly on the same page when it comes to the enforcement side of that. One of the great things that we've been able to do because of our manpower situation and our budget, uh, we just added just a few weeks ago to our drug enforcement unit a specific investigator to work on these opioid deaths and he made his first charge last week a uh, murder charge for a drug dealer who sold methamphetamine that contained fentanyl to someone who overdosed so we tried to put that out there try to put it in the paper to discourage people uh, but we're going to continue to do that so just like sheriff Wright said you got to hold people accountable we all want to hold these drug dealers accountable we want to hold our drug users accountable uh, and also our elected officials on obviously keeping people uh, in in jail and, and getting good strong sentences and setting that standard for all of your upstate counties so thank you sheriff Wright, you mentioned this a few minutes ago a couple of questions back uh, if you see something say something I've always said that the average citizen is the greatest crime fighting force in the world how can we help you gentlemen do your jobs better are there resources for the citizens to go to and and uh, where we will know what to look for who to call um, anything like that for the average citizen so that we can help you better Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, you can go to our um, Facebook page, it's Baltimore County Sheriff's Office Facebook page. Uh, but you, you know, the best the, the best thing I can tell you to do is I don't really need you to know your neighbor's social security number. I do need you to know if the car backed up to the yard belongs there. Um, and and there's nothing wrong with calling. Um, call the neighbor first if you want. Call us. We, we'd like to help you. Uh, you can dial 911. You know, but some people think that you dial 911 only for murders and that stuff. No, you dial 911 when you see a crime being committed or a potential crime being committed. So uh, you, you, there's a non emergency number, Spartanburg is 596 2222. Crime Stoppers is an incredible tool that we get to use. And I think there's some representatives here tonight. Uh, and I tell you, we can't do our job without you. So just pay attention. Just pay attention to what's going on in your neighborhood and, and call. Thank you. And uh, uh, Sheriff McBride, Facebook is something old people use um, <laughs> to communicate. Just uh, <laughs> no, no comment. You, you, can you tweet that? <laughs> Uh, speaking of Facebook uh, and Twitter, uh, we see this every day. I've called you guys personally and asked this question when we get complaints, but everybody has a camera now. 
You know, anytime you go, you guys go out, you're being recorded. I think it's changed so much about what you guys have to do. And I've called you personally when we get tips because you'd be surprised what we get every day. Uh, they'll send us video, and what you see in a snippet of a video can look completely different than what really happened. And this question is getting to excessive force. So you see that every day. And I think, I mean, it's true. There's a few bad apples that have given law enforcement a really bad name, but it's very few. How has that changed what you guys are doing with excessive force, cell phones? They put it right on Facebook without an explanation of what's being done. And it kind of changes the whole ballgame with how you guys have to respond. Is that for me? I think you want to talk about it, yeah. I do <laughs> want to talk about it. <laughs> well, first of all, we're recording you first. We do body-worn video cameras, and we were one of the first counties on this side of the state to get those. Um, we don't have a problem with you videotaping us, but if you're going to put the video clip on there, just show all of it, will you? Um, I'm going to tell you how law enforcement is in Spartanburg, and I, I know these gentlemen can say the same thing. In 2007, a young man by the name of Deputy Kevin Carper was working the road. It was February the 27th, 2007. He was shot and killed by a guy that would have been his 39th arrest. The deputies were doing life-saving measures on him, the bad guy that just killed our deputy, trying to save his life. So I'm not the one to talk to about the police are bad because we're not. We're the good guys. We are always going to be the good guys. And when we have one of our guys or girls get out of line, I'll get them in line. I just need to know. So the, the camera thing has probably helped us more than it's hurt us, if you want to know the truth. Uh, we see it as a positive because there's a lot of evidence that you can collect from people standing around at two, three different angles. You know, so we, we welcome it, but we don't want you to edit it and just show what you want to see. Thank you. Um, Sheriff uh, Reynolds, um, what do your offices do to make sure officers are prepared to deal with those who are mentally ill? We just, we have, I keep, I keep. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. Microphones are something old people use. <laughs> Hey, I yell. <laughs> hey, look, we have just we have just teamed up with the Department of Mental Health to uh, have a working relationship between an employee that will be available to us to to go out on the necessary to the scene or to uh, court, you know have a conversation with the deputy or the victim's advocate to to ensure that we are pursuing things in the correct manner and if any information that, that can be fed to us. Uh, that we don't realize where we're stepping, so to speak. So this that's going to be a really a really big plus for us with the mental health. And just like the, the disability and special needs, you know, we we partner with them. I have a, a chief that's on the board, and we uh, we employ one of the little guys at the office like three days a week to, to help out around the offices, which is really re it's really refreshing to see him working. You know, uh, Sheriff Lewis. We have seen in the news, and some of you have alluded to the immigration problem that we have in this country. Have you seen any refugees coming into our community? Have you been alerted to any of this activity like we've seen down in Florida, certain places of t in Texas and Missouri? We haven't yet. Um, I think South Carolina got 174 was on the list that we'll receive. Whether they're here or not, I don't know. What county they'll go to, I don't know. Uh, we do have some that have ties. Uh, to those they may be more comfortable around in other parts of the state. Um, so we don't know if they'll go there or not. But we, we're waiting, uh, but we will get word. But I, I'm sure we'll get word, but we hadn't seen them yet. Uh, so I don't know where they are in the process, those particular 174. Um, and if that number changes, the lieutenant governor may you know, know before us. But uh, South Carolina was one of the few states that was uh, very much against receiving and having that happen, uh, but because of our population and budget and some of those things that we did take a minimum number, and I think that's how the 174 came about. <laughs> Amen. Did you say send them to Delaware? <laughs> Let me amplify that for you. Send them to Delaware. And uh, right now I'm going to bring in my colleague, uh, Matt Koufax. He is right over here. He's got some questions from the audience. So we're going to take a couple of those for you guys to answer. Uh-oh. Nope. 
there we go. I think I'm, that's what we call missing your cue in the uh, news business. But um, yeah, I just wanted to start, um, and this is a question uh, that I have um, worked with uh, with folks in the legislature as well as with several of you, and we've kind of talked off record about it, but I wanted to get you all on the record since all four of you are up on the same stage tonight. And um, it has to do with uh, you know a legislative angle that I've covered recently having to do with the Open Carry with Training Act that was passed in South Carolina recently. So it allow those obviously with a CWP to carry firearms openly. My question to all four of you, um, and whoever, we, we can start with Sheriff Lewis, um, is are you concerned about what this could potentially mean for policing in certain situations where you may need to confront or detain an individual who is openly carrying a firearm? And in that same vein, how does that work with uh, say like a larger crowd gathering, a group setting. We saw a lot of protests last year. Um, you know, so when you factor that in, how can we keep folks safe um, as people adapt to this new legislation? Well, the first part of your question, if I was concerned, uh, I'm always concerned when you talk about firearms. We had a deputy shot this morning at one o'clock, um, right off Poinsett Highway. Uh, they were out checking a building. Uh, the guy shoots, hits the deputy in the leg or in the, the shin, it goes up his leg and shatters his femur. He was in a three-hour surgery. Um, we got his wife there. He's doing much better uh, before coming over here. Kind of got an update. So you're always concerned now with a, just a rate of violence in general. Uh, but when you talk about open carry uh, with training, you're talking about really law-abiding citizens who are following that. We're not talking about criminals. They don't apply for a uh, concealed weapons permit. They don't register their firearms, and I, I mean that. Like I, so when we encounter people, uh, law-abiding citizens who are concealed weapon permit carriers, now open permit carriers, um, they're very forthcoming about where the weapon is and that they have a permit. We hadn't, I hadn't seen but one person uh, since that actually took effect. We left Palmetto State Armory, and I think the second day. Uh, out on Woodruff Road in the restaurant, a guy was open carrying, and that's the only one I've seen, and I'm out in the public every day, seven days a week. So, so it hasn't been a problem here. Are there people just going to try to force the issue? You know, and um, yeah, sure, you know, there's going to be some of those people that want that confrontation with law enforcement when a deputy walks up or a police officer and says, hey, come here, can I talk to you a minute? Do you have a permit? And he just kind of blows them off and walks away. We hadn't ran into that yet. We certainly anticipate it. Uh, the Sheriff's Association, the South Carolina Criminal Justice Academy has done a great job of putting the information out on making sure deputies and police officers know how to react to that person. Um, so we certainly we don't want any problems, but do we have to prepare for them? Absolutely, but but we hadn't seen any yet. So I was I was very supportive of open carry. Me? Sure. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm I'm with Sheriff Lewis. Most of the, you know I don't know if you guys realize this, but every CWP in our county has to come across our desk. And we do a thorough background check, as much information as we can. And there's some people that I just tell them, you're not going to carry a weapon legally in Spartanburg because, you know, your criminal background is too bad. Now, I don't have a problem with somebody that's made a mistake, you know, some years back and they got their life changed around because people can change. God can change anybody. Uh, but I'm not concerned about that. And I think I've actually seen two. Um, people that's been open carried and you know what we were being told was it's going to be like the wild wild west well it's not you got good men and women who are responsible enough and say I don't buy into the the Bidenism that he ought to tell us what to do you know we have a second amendment that I'm going to protect and we have those rights the, the way and I know I can speak for all these sheriffs up here the men and women who have went across the pond and served us and, and secured our rights, I'm not going to be the failing point of that. So we are we're in a good spot. And this is going to keep people from, from running that mouth and throwing stuff at people that's got guns on their side. I mean, I probably wouldn't choose that crowd to pick on. So. Um, 
Um, Sheriff McBride, just uh, to avoid you kind of answering that same exact question, I'll kind of throw one more uh, just a little follow-up in there. But in some of the work that I've done speaking with firearms instructors, uh, you know, people who own local gun shops and things, they have said to me that they're seeing a lot of first-time gun owners, especially in the last year or so, a lot of novice gun owners, if you will, people who are picking up a firearm for the first time and just, you know, want it there for extra protection or, or whatever. Um, Obviously, SLED has altered a little bit um, what these instructors can teach to people who are applying for a CWP and may or may not want to carry openly. Is there anything that any of you maybe would potentially add to the regulations that need to be taught? Anything that you would stipulate that you know instructors go over with people, whether that be de-escalation or, or something like that? I will, always, I will say this because uh, I'm, I'm with the other sheriffs. I've, I've barely seen it, and, and I think it started August 16th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I will say if you're going to carry it, you should be proficient with it and uh, know how to handle it. Uh, we, we've seen <clears throat> time and time again in the past, because uh, we respond for calls for service with accidental shootings, people shooting themselves in the foot and the leg, uh, a child getting the gun and pointing at another child and shooting the other child. So, you know, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with owning the firearm. And so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, but I will say that um, you train, you know, you fight how you train. That's something, you know, we learned in, in the Army. You fight how you train. Uh, if, you, if you're going to have it, know how to use it. So, but uh, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. I grew up in Texas, so, you know, you, you know where I stand on it. But, uh, but anyway, I, I do think that people should, if they see uh, second level, third level uh, opportunities to go to, to receive more training, I definitely think they should take advantage of it and know that gun as, as well as they can. I, too, have only seen one instance, and uh, I, too, support the Second Amendment and the open carry. I didn't flinch on it because, as the sheriff right off, off already alluded, the bad guys are going to have a gun. They don't read the rules, and they could care less about a permit. That's the reason I understand, as far as I know, there's a big debate in this state about concealed, I mean, uh, open carry versus constitutional carry. Well, it comes right back down to the good versus the bad. So. I don't have any problem with the guns except with the bad guys have them. So I think now we are going to turn to our audience for a couple of questions. I'm going to bring up a couple folks. Um, the first one is Miss Karen Martin, if she is here. Oh, she's she right here. Uh, so Karen works for a uh, nonprofit animal rescue, and she has a question that is specifically directed for Sheriff Reynolds. Karen? Hi, Sheriff. I, I know you're behind that flag. Can't quite see you. Um, I worked um, in the animal welfare field for about 20 years, and during that time I have followed uh, state and county laws and ordinances concerning animal welfare and animal cruelty. And let me just say that since you've taken office, your team has done a fantastic job in your county addressing those issues. So my question is, yeah, he certainly has. Would you share with us what has changed in your county since you've taken office? What policies, procedures, or decisions that you and your team have done to lead you to be so effective and make a difference in Lawrence County? Well, I, I found one thing. When there, if you go in most of the time, too much time, too many times down there, if you arrest a drug dealer, you find weapons involved that are illegal, you, you find the drugs, you find the weapons, you find the mistreated children. The house is so deplorable that, that you have to take a, literally, I've seen them take shovels like a stall to shovel their kitchen out with defecation to be blunt on the floor. The urine is so strong that the, you can't, they have to wear respirators to go in these houses. So we just start at the other end. We go, for, uh, we get calls now, naturally, and I've got a guy, I've got a team of people that are unreal. They're unbelievable. They work, they work themselves in the ground. But if you look in the faces of these poor defenseless pups, to me it's the same thing, just about you see these poor vulnerable adults and these children. They're all, you, it's just all on one string. So don't think for a moment when, a lot of times when you go in there and make these drug charges and all these other illegal charges, that in that circle, 
if you look, there are these animals, there are these conditions of the home, and we uh, just made up our mind to declare war on it when I first come in office, and uh, and we've quite often arrested husband and wife. It's not very unusual at all in Lawrence County for the husband and the wife to go to jail. So uh, if it was not for the piles of Anderson, we couldn't do what we do. We don't have a facility, we have 44 dog runs. If it was not for Dr. Sanders, she is an angel. She, uh, if it was not for her and the Charleston Animal Society, I believe maybe if I've got that right, if it was not for them, we couldn't do this because they send tractor trailers nearly what you might say up here and load these poor animals up and carry them back to their location to help us out. If not, we, I don't, it would be, I don't even, can't bring myself to think about it, but we just work in an animal in back to the drug. We get drugs, we get weapons, we get the other mistreatment. We just start at the other end, and uh, I enjoy seeing them go to jail. <laughs> and for our next question, we have uh, Miss Diane Mitchell. Here she is right here. Diane is the newly elected president of the Greenville County Republican Women's Club. Congratulations. <laughs> and she has a question uh, that she wants to start with Sheriff Lewis, but all four of you are, yeah, uh, can feel free to answer this one. She says it's kind of open on this one. Thank you, and thank you to all of our sheriffs. I, with, from the bottom of my heart, thank you because it's so important, and I hope everybody here understands, and I hope that all the people in your counties understand, constitutional sheriffs protect us from the overreach of the federal government, and all of these guys are constitutional sheriffs. Uh, the Biden administration has demonstrated their shift in focus regarding domestic terrorism, most recently by sending the FBI to investigate parents who speak out at school board meetings. How is it handled when a person from our community is labeled by a federal intelligence agency as a domestic terrorist or is even mentioned in a threat assessment? So here in South Carolina, we don't have the authority to enforce any federal law. So, um, so if the FBI called us and said, uh, Greenville County School PTA from school so-and-so is a, is a threat to national security and they've been protesting outside the district office, we're not, we're not going to do anything about that. We're not going to go there and, and handle it in that way. We, if you have a problem with a parent or a teacher has a confrontation, obviously they can call us on the county level. Uh, but when you talk about categorizing people who have and, and uh, enjoy the freedoms in this great country to assemble like we are here today and speak your mind in a public forum, as long as the district allows a certain number of people in, you know, we, we really can't do anything about that. Uh, whether or not the district allows you to speak, we can't do anything about that. But what we can do uh, is not let the federal government come in, whether it's any alphabet group, whatever it is, uh, come in and start asking questions and categorize you as a, as a terrorist in any way. Um, I, again, I think that, you know, the Biden administration does a lot of things and they put it out there as a barometer to kind of see how it floats. You know, does it hold water? Is it people going to resist to it? And when they get a little bit of resistance, they, it tends to just kind of fade away. Um, but I think it will show its head again, you know, whether it's a mask mandate or vaccine or whatever it is. Um, and, again, South Carolina is so much different. We do everything together. And I think you'll find as sheriffs in South Carolina, the first thing we did with the vaccine mandate was met and said, uh, united put a united front out and said we're not mandating we want to make sure our folks get paid but we're not mandating the vaccine so once we found out that our folks would continue to get paid through the county because they are an extension of the sheriff we're not going to enforce a mandate we did that together i think you would see the same thing if that tried to happen here and you know hats off to the greenwood county school board and burt Royster for the way they do handle things i know it doesn't make everybody happy sometimes but when you get several hundred people in there protesting and they're standing out front and there's two different sides they really we were there they really did a good job of handling that uh, at the time because nobody saw it coming some wanted masks some did not some wanted full-time school some did not so uh, 
there's a lot of tension involved. Um, and again, I think those we worked it out here, and people were able to talk and, and certainly be heard. I think that made the biggest difference. In other parts of the country, they tried to lock the door and just wouldn't allow anybody in, and they were going to make decisions for our children behind closed doors. We're not about that. That's not going to happen here, uh, certainly not anywhere in the upstate. So I hope that answered it. I got to rambling a little bit. Does, is there any part of that I need to clarify? The school board, when Absolutely. there is labeling going on with domestic terrorism, they have changed, or they're looking at changing in the lexicon the definition of domestic terrorist. And so if they change, could succeed in changing it to not include an international component, then any of us could be considered a domestic terrorist if we oppose their political ideology. Absolutely. You couldn't be more right. And what we do, we have a large influence on our elected officials here in South Carolina, all across the state, uh, as, as the 46 sheriffs. Um, so it's important for us to stand our ground and tell them what we ask them to do or what we want. And all of us together certainly do that. But it's more important for you to get involved, too. we got midterm elections coming up, and I think that's going to be a huge test to see which way not only the country goes, but which way our state goes. Will we stay on course? what will happen in our various counties throughout the state that's going to tell you a lot about what's allowed to happen here not just on a national level please don't get sidetracked worrying about what's happening in dc when everything's crumbling right here under your feet uh, pay attention to who's in office pay attention to what's happening on these county council races uh, city council races uh, state level races but it's up to us the general public the the voter to contact our elected official and demand better and tell them you're representing us uh, to stop those kind of things from happening. Biden can't do what he's doing uh, if we don't allow him to do it. And the problem is we're, uh, we're, we're not going to be hoodwinked by him and, uh, and distracted. So we're all on the same page when it comes to that, for the, unless somebody wants to add something. Oh, I do. <laughs> Everything he said I agree with. So I want you to know that um, people constantly ask me about the vaccination. The vaccination. Uh, I'm, I'm not opposed to the vaccination. I'm opposed to the federal government telling us how we live our lives. I'm, I'm not opposed to a mask. If people want to wear a mask, wear the mask. But this is nothing more than another distraction to keep them, to try to keep us from seeing that they're printing money. And they're they're letting their borders. I mean, my goodness, Coca Cola, they woke, don't you know? <laughs> they, you they opposed and had the, um, the 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 baseball all star game moved out of Atlanta because they opposed voter ID. But if you go on the Coke's website, they'll tell you in order for you to come in our factory, you got to show your ID. Yeah. <laughs> well, what about that? So um, about being labeled something, I oppose everything that that ding bat Biden is doing, so <laughs> label me what you want to. I tell you what, though, and I said that truly to be funny. We are called as Christians to pray for our leaders. We don't have to agree with them. We don't have to like the looks of them. We don't have to like what they say. But we are called to pray for them. So I'm praying that they will find Jesus. I mean, that's what they need. Yeah. So I don't really care. It, when they start saying what Antifa really is, then I'll start paying attention to what they label us. <laughs> the only thing I'd like to add is uh, not only do we all agree on this as sheriff, especially here in the upstate, but uh, the, the important thing you need to know is there is a there's thousands of sheriffs across the nation that agree with the same exact thing that we all agree on. And I can tell you, if push comes to shove, you know, it's, it, your sheriffs will stand up when the time is right and they will take care of business. But um, they could, you know, they come to, first of all, let me say this. I have school age kids. I have senior in high school, a sophomore in high school, and a first grader. And, uh, and, and it, it sickens me to even think about what the world could be when they're my age. And so, uh, and Sheriff Wright's right. You got to pray, and you got to pray that things uh, change. I don't see how things can't change with a 32 percent or 34 percent approval rating. A bunch of idiots. But anyway, the thing is, is uh, 
we do have to protect our children and the schools that they're in. Not everybody has an opportunity to homeschool or can afford to homeschool, so we have to do what we can. But I have to allow people to express their First Amendment rights all the time. You know, if they want to march, protest, and everything else, and they may even be protesting on a subject that I don't agree with, but I still have to protect their rights to do it. Right. And by God, I'll protect the rights of parents to do it in the school board meeting right. or anywhere else they want to. May, as long as you're peaceful and not inciting violence, you're protected in our county, and I know in these counties too. Right. Well, I guess it's just as simple as just say no, because I'm not going to uh, cooperate with any, any such as far as a federal officer requesting some nonsense. That's how, that, as I've heard these other sheriffs refer to, this is being done through fear and intimidation. It's that simple. It's not complicated. They follow the road map. It's been out there a long time. If I get you scared of me enough, and I bully you enough, I can push you anywhere I want to. And that's all this is about. It's that simple. But thank you. I think that's done. Anybody? There we go. I think that's it from our end for now. Um, I don't know if we're going to open this back up a little later, but for now, I think we're going to send it back to our moderators. Um, I'm going to kind of come back just to something that's recent. Uh, and you hear it a lot. I hear it all the time, you know, just in the communities, like, what is happening? Uh, it seems like violent crime. Uh, we're having shootings. So just this weekend in Greenville, it was uh, popping off left and right on Saturday. Uh, Sled just came out with this report. Uh, homicides are up 25%. In the last five years, we're up 51% for homicides. In South Carolina, uh, in 2020, aggravated assaults. I mean, I've been here since 2006, and I, I can see personally what I report on in the news cycle. It's a lot worse it is today than it was even just five years ago. I mean, what's happening? Like, what is, what's the cycle? What's, can you guys kind of get some insight on what you're seeing? And, you know, what do you do to get ahead of this? Or is it kind of already, you can't get to that point? What do you do? Well, our population is growing um, exponentially. I mean, it's, we got people moving here from all over the country. So that certainly adds into it. But what you have is the people who have lost touch with feelings for other people. Nobody cares anymore. They resort to something quick, they get mad at each other, they want to resolve that with a firearm. Um, or, you know, we have drug issues. We have retribution shootings. We have nightclub shootings. Everybody's talking about nightclubs and we're trying, we're, you know, as we close nightclubs when these happen, that's not going to stop these shootings. That just stops where it occurs. These are gang-related shootings. One person is shot and killed over drugs or money or territory. Then the other side uh, comes maybe from another county. Um, it just depends. I mean, gang-related shootings certainly account for a large part of what we have here. You still have domestic violence issues, again, where people get angry and they resort directly to a firearm. Uh, instead of calling us out there, you have we're engaging more in deadly force situations. Um, so, I mean, it's a culmination of things, but I think, uh, again, if you look at the population of Greenville County and Spartanburg, Anderson, look at property values, look at building permits that are coming, those numbers are very close to that 20% of what we're growing per year. Um, I'm not saying we're bringing in bad people. I'm just saying we're growing uh, for sure. And a lot of our young people who are getting at a certain age, hanging out with their friends, and they're deciding whether they're going to be in a gang or taking guns to school. We had one this morning, uh, I think, at Hughes Academy. Um, you know, we got to do a better job of mentoring our young men uh, for sure and, and really getting the message out to our young people that guns do not resolve anything. Uh, so we certainly tried to implement some mentoring programs through the SROs, and uh, for the first time in Greenville history, we got to uh, now have deputies in all the elementary schools, and I think that'll pay huge dividends for having that role model in elementary schools. But it's it's tough; not everybody can make that happen. You know, uh, that's a that's a huge budget increase and a, and a lot of manpower shifting to make that happen. So um, I think we'll we're certainly having to adjust and catch up too, and try to find ways to to combat that. I, I would agree with what Sheriff Lewis said. Um, I, I think it's got a lot to do about about all about all of our shootings are gang related. Um, we have got to do a better job in our homes. Um, I want everybody that might be listening to pass this message along. 
law enforcement should not have to raise your child. Right. You know, you should do that at home. I mean, we have a lot of, of the different, um, you know, domestic shooting, that's a heat of passion thing. Uh, but these drive-by shootings are crazy. And they don't care who they hit. They'll kill a child. They'll kill a grandmother. Um, this is why I need for people to be in contact with us more and let us just pour the information into us. Because a lot of times you might see the car, some crazy car that went down the wrong neighborhood. Now we've got a tag number and we've got someone to work back to. We're working one in Spartanburg that happened, you know, where a car was being burnt and, you know, some guy was killed. And, you know, li listen, I heard people say this. Well, these are drug dealers killing each other. It's really helping us. No, it's not. Those are still people. Those are still somebody's child. You know, they're a child of God. I mean, we, we, we have to do a better job in our homes first. And I don't think it's the police's problem. Um, it is ours. The aftermath is we've got to do a better job of raising our t teenagers. And like the sheriff said, you know, we've got a lot of deputies in school. It makes a huge difference because sometimes that's the only positive male figure that these young men and women see. Um, so I want to, you know, encourage everybody to please talk to your kids. Be nosy about your kids. I mean, if you don't be nosy and find out who they're talking to on the computer and what their activities are, you know, you don't be surprised if we're knocking on your door because little Johnny just really don't normally do that. But, I mean, you know, you, you just got to you gotta raise them, raise them, raise them, okay? So. I got a whole soapbox on this. <laughs> so, who all's got children? All right. And I just told you I have three of them. And I'm not the world's best dad, but I can tell you. Uh, if, you're, if your child's about to uh, do something and you get onto them and you send them to your room and you, and you call them back out five, ten minutes later and you say, I'll tell you what, if you tell me that you won't do it again, that's okay. You can start doing whatever you're going to do again. Then they do it again and you send them back to the room or maybe put them in the corner or something like that for a few minutes. And, and my point is that's the way our judicial system is right now. And it's constantly, if you tell us you're not going to do it again and plead guilty, we'll let you go. We may slap on a little probation or something like that. Here's the problem. There's nothing to fear anymore as far as punishment. There's no punishment for these people. Every now and then we get a lucky break and somebody gets sent down the road for 20 years and we celebrate because we're like, that, that dude's finally out of our hair for 20 years. We have people in the community begging for help because we have a certain problem situation in the community and we, fi and we finally make a case, put them in jail, and then they're out either the next day or, you know, out before, you know, the investigators even through their investigation completely. There, there is no punishment anymore, and this is what I'm seeing time and time again. And let me tell you a quick story. Just, was it 2019 when Judge Chief Justice Beatty rescinded the bench warrants? Was it 2019? Okay, if that may mean nothing to you. Let me explain the bench warrant. If you have court, I say uh, your lawnmower stolen, and uh, we catch the guy, and we have a court date. Bad guy decides, well, I don't feel like going to court today. Well, that's cool. He don't have to. But the officer and the victim does. If the officer or the victim doesn't show up for court, the case is dismissed. But if the suspect doesn't show up, the judge has to go, you know what? We're going to send him a certified letter because because these uh, dirt bags have addresses, right? We're gonna send them a certified letter and let them know that they can have court again a month from now. Same thing happens again, the victim comes to court, the officer comes to court, bad guy says, eh, I don't feel like it, I'm not going to court. Judge has to do it again. And I'm gonna tell you, usually by the third time, either the victim's fed up with the judicial system, they're not showing up, or their boss ain't gonna let them off again, or perhaps the officer can't show up for court case is dismissed anyway and that's just a just a small example of what's going on in your state of South Carolina and if you want to change that you need to get a hold of your legislators because we need help we can't do this by ourselves your deputies can't do this by themselves we need your help and on and furthermore when we do put these people in jail and they get a ridiculous low bond 
So if you get a surety bond for $10,000, you've got to come up with 10% to get out, right? And that's $1,000, unless you go through a bail bondsman where you only have to come up with 2%, which is $200, okay? Most of these guys had it in their sock or their underwear when they came into jail with them that day. So my point is, is we, if you really want to help us, you really want to back the blue, you need to get a hold of your legislators and you need to tell them that we, we need to put a conservative chief justice as a head of our South Carolina Supreme Court. And I, I don't know what it's going to take. Prison farms, hard labor, I don't care. Make them do, make them do it. Sheriff Wright had a great bill that he had uh, worked really hard with one of his local legislators that I came to Spartanburg County and back to, you know, a couple years ago where and, you know, it was a modernized chain gang, except the chain was a belt made out of uh, it was a taser belt, basically, I think. Oh, yeah. Nobody wants to get shocked at that. <laughs> Man, I'm all for it. If we have to build more prisons, so be it. Well, I mean, when's the last time we, this state built a prison? The lieutenant Governor may know. I don't know. It's probably late 70s, early 80s, I would guess. Yeah. That's when I was born. So that tells you how long ago that was. <laughs> that was a long time ago now. It's 43 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> my point is, my point is, that was a long time ago to my kids at least. So, but Girl, we we gotta have help. Focus. We gotta help have help. So I, I we're blessed in Anderson County. We got some good legislators uh, that do try to vote on these bills that's going to support law enforcement. But that's not the, that's not the the standard throughout the whole state, I promise you. You need to pay attention to what's going on in your legislative bodies. That's where it makes a difference. That's where it supports us. So, you know, get those guys up here. And, you know, I appreciate y'all asking, you know, some, I mean, good questions that concern you, but you need to grill those guys and gals. Yeah. You know, I read the lapel pin on Chuck Wright there, Sheriff Wright. You know, there's one aspect we'll leave out of this thing, and they talk about police reform, but we need to reform a whole lot of this society because we've taken God out of everything. And uh, I mean, T totally. So until we, like you say, the judicial system, we start getting a little tough. And I thought I did something. I got elected in 16. I called Robert Benfield, man over his. I said, I got a great idea, sir. I was sitting at a red light. I said, I'm going to bring the chain gang down in Lawrence County. He didn't say anything. I said, hello. He said, I said, I want a pair of mirror sunglasses and I want a shotgun on the hip. <laughs> I said, I watched all them old movies and I'm going to make them understand and remember Lawrence County. He didn't, I said, you still there? He said, I beg of you. You know how he talks. He said, I beg of you, do not do this. Beg of you. <laughs> he said, you'll get yourself in more trouble than you can get out of. So I had an idea, but I got told I was insane. But we don't bring back the good. It, all this world's about good and bad. That's all it is, good and bad. We fight the bad every day. Thank you. I wanted to go ahead and let you guys know that we did introduce a bill. It's called the State Workforce Program Bill, and uh, it's equal opportunist. I mean, so we can do men and women. Um, but what, what we were doing, we were we had a bill that said if you got convicted of a nonviolent crime, uh, you couldn't be sentenced to this no more than five years. Um, we want you to patch potholes, cut grass on all state and county owned property. Nowhere could you bid out for businesses, you know, to have these people come work on your place because that breeds corruption. So we took all that out. We even put in there if you mishandled the prisoners, um, <laughs> then you get to go join them and, and help them. <laughs> and the one person that opposes it the most is the one that would help the most, which is Brian Sterling, the guy over the prison system. I even invited him down to help us write the bill, and I get no help. I mean, I got Democrats and Republicans going, that's a great bill. I'm like, well, why don't you pass the stupid thing? It just don't make any sense. You have a lot of lip service from some folks, and you know, I get held accountable, which I am thankful for because I work for the people. I don't work for me. I don't have a private business. I work for you. So these people work for you as well. So how about helping us 
get their little uh, honeys in line. <laughs> there are so many things that are being uh, that are going on in the state legislatures that don't even we, we shouldn't even be involved in. We should make sure to take care of our people. It is so bad when the prisoners now they have rights and I want to keep them rights. But they get treated by some forms of government much better than our veterans and our law enforcement and the good people do. That's wrong. That's wrong, and we got to fix it. And, and the only way to fix it is to put people in there that have the same core values, not just during the election time. And, and that's important. But they need to they need to stick to what they they say they're going to do. You know, don't make a bunch of promises you can't keep, and a lot of people do. But we we got to hold them accountable, and I don't think we as voters are doing a good job of that. I got friends that I don't want to see get voted out, but you know what? If I'm the problem, I'm going to get voted out. So let's we got to stick together. Okay, we can do it if we just stick together. Uh, final question for this evening. Drugs, alcohol, violence all seem to travel in the same groups. Um, there are some people that want marijuana to be legalized here in South no, Carolina. No, no. <laughs> Will the gentleman kindly refrain? Uh, Representative Todd Rutherford also recommended this week to reduce the drinking age to 18 here in South Carolina. Uh, how do you gentlemen feel about this? No. No, my name's Chuck Wright from Spartanburg County. No, um, Miss, I don't. I'm not going to say much about Mr. Rutherton. He and I don't agree on a lot of things. Um, I, I, I don't agree with that. I mean, you got now. You, you know, you can go serve your country overseas, but you can't drink a beer on base. If you want to work on something, work on that where they got the controlled environment. But it's been my experience, and I was. A long time ago, I was 18, and I didn't make the right choices because of those things. So you just add alcohol to it, and it's, it's bad. And, and I want people to explain to me, if marijuana is so good for us, what happened to smoking is bad for you? Did that go away just because they got an agenda to push? No, what it is is a lot of the people, their, quote, constituents, are getting caught bringing marijuana in, and they want to fix that. So I have no problem with... Uh, if the FDA approves a pill, a shot, an oil that, that will help people who are sick, because I don't want to take medicine away from people that are sick, but but I don't. It is just not a good idea to let people smoke dope while you're going down the road, because that's a gateway drug, and then we'll argue until the sun comes up if you'd like. So that's all I got to say about that. Um, I too. I mean, I'm against both. Um, I, I had a best friend that ran uh, when I ran in 2016. He, he got diagnosed with kidney cancer. Uh, as he was dying, one of the things that gave him some relief was murinol, uh, which is a byproduct. So that you know it helped build his appetite. He gained some weight back, which helped him get treated. Uh, you know, from having radiation and some of those things. So I see the value in that. Uh, but we were able to get that. If you got a prescription for those byproducts, whether it's Miranol or maybe you have a child that has epilepsy and you found that that helps them, by all means, uh, that should be approved through the FDA. You should have a prescription for it. But I don't want to see anybody rolling up weed and smoking it. Um, I don't want our kids to have easier access to it than they already do. Um, we just buried a seven-year-old girl who was hit by a drunk driver. Uh, last weekend and killed they were simply grandmother was simply taking these kids home dropping one off and, and taking another one back to her house had no idea uh, that this guy was severely impaired and going to pull out on white horse road uh, running well in excess of the speed limit and just t-bone them out of the blue uh, that's an alcohol issue that's driving on the influence if you think marijuana doesn't bring that same thing to the table you're badly mistaken uh, so anybody who, who agrees or pushes that or even underage drinking uh, I wouldn't want to know that I supported something that an 18 year old made a bad decision was impaired and it changed their life for somebody else's forever. 21 is the number. Let's stick with it. Uh, it's, uh, it's worked as well as it could so far. Uh, we still are, are 
driving on the influence cases are tremendous and nobody talks about it anymore but uh, Mothers Against Truck Driving does a great job here in the upstate of uh, really staying focused on it and pushing it out to these young people at prom and in high schools um, we, we certainly have to I don't think we let go of that I would have to agree. I, th I think, uh, for medicinal purposes, I think there's some uh, there, there's some variations in, in qualities that can certainly help. I know a family personally that has a daughter that has epilepsy, and uh, CBD oil has been extremely helpful for her, and it's it's uh, neutralized a lot of the seizures that she has. So I, I definitely think there's some medicinal components to it. But if you have to roll it up in the form of a joint or a blunt or whatever, that's done a good thing. So uh, and I've I've seen a lot of people. I know there's a ton of people out there that'll disagree, but uh, you know I've, I've I've seen people get stuck on it and uh, become an addict on it, just like anything else, just like alcohol. So uh, you know, and and one thing's for sure, legalizing it, that's going to obligate us to have more things that we have to do as far as you know the governance of it and and regulations and uh, enforcing regulations and. You know, I think we got our work cut out for us already. So uh, I hope yeah, hope that's not something we have to deal with anytime soon. But uh, as far as alcohol in 21, you know, I mean, um, yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of responsibility that comes with uh, drinking alcohol. I went to Wren High School, and, and in four years we lost 11 students, and half of those were drinking and driving accidents. And you know, I was I was I was a fortunate one because I was a little bit of a rogue kid myself. Had a fake ID and everything else. It said that I was 22 when I had it. But you yeah. know, anyway. But um, all right. Statute of limitations, though. I'm good. I'm good. Statute of limitations. That's misdemeanor. But uh, the army squared me away. Um, but anyway, I, you know, I think uh, I'll just pass it on to Don. A few minutes ago, he was on a soapbox. <laughs> no, I'm against raising the drinking age. We have enough tragedy, and as far as being at the crossroads of a health issue, I can't imagine uh, if you had a loved one that that in any kind of tight way would assist. But as far as smoking dope, they lace marijuana now. They, I mean, they there's no way to know. It's just the marijuana they're smoking now is not the marijuana when the hippies were out there doing their thing at Woodstock, so I didn't go either. What was it? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have enough money to get there. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm against raising the age, and uh, as far as smoking dope, that's ridiculous. That's, uh, I had to go to the hospital a couple of years ago and look into an 11 year old child's face that I'd known since he was three years old that was killed by a gentleman that was smoking lots of marijuana and he killed him and almost killed his mama um, broke three vertebrae in her neck she's suffering now and the kid's name was Ethan Rubenzer and he was taken from us because a guy thought it was okie dokie to smoke marijuana and drive over 100 miles an hour. That's the kind of mind altering things that does to you. Now, what these gentlemen are talking about, the byproducts, don't do that. Okay? And I'm not opposed to that. But, um, I mean, come on. Where in the heck are we in this world when we think giving dope to people is the right thing to do? And we're better than that. And we need to tear Todd Rutherton. We're better than that. And that's going to wrap up this portion. So, Sheriffs, I really appreciate your time. And I think we're going to have a couple of announcements before we uh, dismiss.